Okay, let's get started. I'd like to welcome you back. This is lecture 12 of our computational biology class. E443, 543. As always, I need to remind you that the class is live streamed and made available for public viewing afterwards. Appreciate that. Today, we're going to be talking about cubitaxis. And we may add a little bit of material to this. Uh, we last time ended talking about the linear gradient, cubitaxis of the linear gradient. I'd like to do the self-constructed gradient exercise, uh, tell you a little bit about how to manipulate cubitaxis uh, on a cell-by-cell -cell basis in Python. I have added some slides on angiogenesis, which is a nice example, uh, which uh, we could do together and is pretty simple. Uh, and then maybe we'll get to dealing with uh, bacteria macrophage simulation. Uh, and there's also, as usual, I have the code in the student materials folders, uh, demos for lecture 12. I think I've got everything zipped. So you might want to take a minute to download some of those files if you want to run them to make them easier. Uh, definitely, for example, for the Given taxes dependent on parameters, that's not a, a simulation you want to be running, writing in, in class. It's one that you might want to look at as a, a model for the things you're going to be doing uh, in your own projects. So I want to remind you that the projects for this class, uh, people forget because the assignment's given so early in the semester, uh, have a number of components. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, a write-up, a uh, report, paper, could be a journal article style, or paper report style if you prefer, uh, explaining the biology of the problem, uh, the mathematics uh, that you use to solve that problem, uh, the code you develop, and the main results. And since these are team projects, it's important that you indicate who did what in that write-up. And it's also important that that be in your own words. That can be a little bit more difficult when you're having a single source that you're replicating, but ultimately what's important is to show that you understand the thing that you're working on. And so it's very important that you explain things your way, not just copying the, the words that were used in the source paper. Since the goal of this is a data hub application, uh, it's important to think about a set of tutorials and exercises that give a clear background and learning objectives for using the tool that you're building. You have to have the CompuCell tool itself uploaded to NanoHub. One of the things that we haven't really covered yet is steering. How do you build a steering panel so that a user on NanoHub can change parameters? We'll try to cover that next week, but it's actually pretty simple. Uh, there are demos of it uh, in the demo package in CompuCell. The manuals are pretty clear about it. Uh, if you go to the NanoHub apps online, you'll see those things in action. And so it's important to learn how to do those. As always, if people want to do a video tutorial on the application and upload it to NanoHub, uh, that's a few extra points for the project. Uh, you'll be expected to have a slide deck and or do an oral presentation of the project. And You'll also be expected to uh, partner with one of the other uh, teams and do a, a detailed review of their project. And that has to be done in advance so that the suggestions that you have are given early enough that people can revise the projects. And then you'll also be asked to do uh, more basic reviews of every project that's presented. Uh, but the detailed review is the more important one. And so those are the Bain project requirements. If there are any questions about that, uh, please feel free to ask me or Giuliano about it or Hayden. And we're happy to, to help you understand what the requirements are. The timing of the semester is tight. The original due date for these was April 11th, 
I pushed them back by a week. That means that final projects will have to be presented uh, in the exam week, in this time slot during the exam week. But it does mean that you need to have everything in a preliminary form ready to present April 18th. So in two weeks. Uh, that would mean uh, a working version of the code, uh, exercises, slide decks, and so on. And then you'll present that material uh, on April 18th. And then the following couple of days, uh, each pair of teams will meet. Uh, the presenting team will present the uh, work in detail and the uh, Reviewing team will write up a detailed critique of that, and that needs to be done pretty fast because it needs to be done in time for people to be able to modify what they're doing. And so then you have essentially two weeks to revise the work that you've done, and then we'll have another round of final presentations uh, and a final upload. And I can't grade you. Uh, until there is working application and documentation on NanoHub. And so uh, if you're going to need an incomplete for the class because you can't get that done in time, uh, please, I don't encourage that, but if you need it, please talk to me as soon as possible about it so we can plan appropriately. But uh, your collaboration and in-class presentations are an important part of the purpose of this course. And so it's important to take the presentation part of it seriously. If you're thinking about doing a little video about the about the application, you could use your in-class presentation as a dry run for those videos, for example. Are there any questions about the, the structure of the assignment or the timeline? Do you know when on May 3rd we'll have to present? It will be at this time. Okay, I have an exam during this time on Wednesday, May 3rd. Um, I can also talk to you at the end of class if that's better. Okay, so then we're going to have to make arrangements around that. That's, uh, that's one reason that I don't like to slip the timeline. But uh, in that case, you'll, you probably will need to present the week before. That would be uh, April, 20, uh, April 19th, April 27th. Okay. Okay, so I'd like to go around the room then and ask people, uh, I've been asking in sort of generic terms uh, about how things are going, but I need you to answer now more specifically, where are you with the CC3D application development? Where are you with writing the report? Where are you with the NanoHub uploads? And where are you with developing educational exercises and tutorials? And so if the answer is you haven't started yet, then that's it's where you are, but I think it's important to recognize that these are, it's, it's a quite extensive set of requirements for this class. And so that it, it's not something that one could do in a week. And so if you haven't made progress on all of these areas now, uh, it's, it's important that you, you start working on them right away because you, you basically have two weeks now to get a preliminary version of these things done. So, how shall we go around the room? Uh, maybe just start, Carmen. How? Tell us where you are with things. Um, our group's finishing up working on the application development before starting the uh, report and NanoHub uploads. Great. Uh, I think one thing that 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 is often not not so familiar is this idea of trying to sorry. Not so familiar is this idea of trying to develop. Uh, educational exercises and tutorials. And I, I do encourage you to look at other NanoHub apps. I encourage you to look at Paul Macklin's uh, PhysiCell apps on NanoHub, which are very good uh, in an educational context. And also to reach out to Hayden, who's an expert in, in trying to design uh, educational questions that you can solve with uh, computation. And so we, we will do our best to make those resources available to people. So 
Let's see, going around the room, who, who is next? Who wants to go? Uh, you can report for yourself or your group. I'll just go through the, the, the roster one at a time. So Logan. Um, so Nick and I are finishing up the CC3D application. So um, actually yesterday and today I've been working on making sure that like certain parameters on versus off match the data we see in the literature. And so far they are, which is really good. Um, and then we we haven't done anything with the nano hub uploads, but I have already started like developing my outlines for the educational exercises and tutorials. And then I know Nick is working on the documentation. So the only thing we haven't really started is those uploads. Great. Okay. So if I duplicate people, just tell let help me out. Uh Ibrahim, you're next. Yeah, Pat, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um like Carmen said, we're just working on finishing up the, the CC3D model. I think we could probably uh, simultaneously because not everyone can work on the CC3 at, at the same time. So I think we'll also get started with the, the report and then like the the learning pathway as well, probably as soon as possible. I mean, why, I think that that's something that's important that if you have a team, one of the reasons to use a team is that you can share duties. So if one person is doing coding, another person could do a design of educational opportunities or figuring out how to do the uploads. So, so try to try to be as uh, uh, try to try to take advantage of that diversity if you can. So let's see, Jonathan. So uh, our team, we have uh, the Morpheus model that we're translating into CC three D. Uh, there's still uh, quite a bit of work to do with that. Uh, as for writing the report, figuring out the nano hub uploads, and the educational exercises, we have to begin on that as well, to be completely honest with you. So you, you spoke on splitting the, the work, and that's something we still need to discuss. Um, so this week, we're, we're planning on uh, hitting it harder in the second half of the week and catching back up. I mean, I, have, I haven't had a chance. I mean... I'm, again, I keep I'm, I'm available to meet with you to discuss the paper and and thinking about nano how to translate the Morpheus ideas into into CompuCell. Giuliano is as well, so I, I really do encourage if you're if you're having issues, please do take advantage of that. I understand that these are non-trivial uh, things to do. Let's see who's next, Gabriel. Yeah, so. Basically, the only thing left, I'm actually, so I'm meeting this Thursday with Giuliano and Joel to get the optimization part all plugged into CompuCell. Um, but that's the only thing that's left. Um, other than that, I, I, when thinking about the educational part of it, I was just thinking, I was thinking more of something like a drop down menu for different obstacles or something. I don't know. I'll play around with that. That one I haven't thought about as much. Um, the report, I, I keep a uh, the way I usually typical, typically go about research is I keep like a lab book or notebook or whatever. And I kind of treat that as like a living paper. So the, so that, you know, what's kind of nice is that by the end of it, then I end up having a whole paper almost so that I just need to clean up. So, so that's actually looking pretty good and yeah, that's about it. Yeah. That's a, that's a nice uh, approach to things in the fall when we do, of course, when we do, uh, the, the networks course, everything is taught in Jupyter Notebooks. And so basically you can do your documentation and your project in, as you're doing your coding because you can put everything into the same Jupyter Notebook. And so you're, you're basically a live paper is the application. Uh, here, because CompuCell runs in a freestanding uh, application, uh, doing that embedding, take, you can't really embed it. Actually, we had a student, an undergraduate student uh, last year who was working on um, Jupyter Notebook version of CompuCell uh, to allow that. And, and I hope maybe for next year, we'll have that available for people. But at the moment, uh, uh, doing that by hand is still uh, a, bit, a bit necessary. Okay, let's see, is there, who have I, is there a group that I've missed or do I have a, Elmer? Uh, Elmer and uh, JH, I guess. And, Elmer, go ahead. 
they're in the the same group as me so we're all on the same page yeah so can you hear me hello can you hear me no yeah you're good Albert. i don't know can you hear me no one Somehow it doesn't work. Yes, Elmer, we can hear you. Look, so, okay, okay, great. So um, I'm about the list. Um, we we are in the in still in developing the CCC D application. We was a little bit exercise to get this understand the Morpheus model, but we see now quite through, and we have translated this in Python, and um, now we still have to implement it properly in CC three D. The report uh, not really started with the report yet. We have nano hop upload running with just a basic project that uh, that does cell division, but it's it was just a, a basic project to get all of this done. This is actually quite a process with these people to have this done, but it gives us actually an error and crashes and we have still to figure out why it crashes and the uh, educational exercise we have not yet looked into that so there's quite some things to do for our group yeah. the biggest thing is solved is the nano nano hop thing yeah okay thank you uh mike and JH, do you have anything you want to add? I'm with uh, Carmen uh, Abraham Hayden. So we're, yeah, we're um, working. I think we're getting to a good point where we can start working on the uh, report and educational stuff um, and just finishing up the application. That's um, fine. Again, I just want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak, even if. Even if one of your other team members uh, spoke, sometimes you'll have something you want to add. So I want to make sure I get everybody's the opportunity. Thank you. Gage? Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Again, I don't want to be, I don't want to make this sound too intimidating or too difficult, but I also want, uh, by past experience, I know life happens and people get busy. Uh, and uh, I don't want people to get squeezed at the end of the semester. And that's why I'm, I'm pushing a little bit now. Okay, so I want to come back now to where we were uh, last week. And we had talked about uh, the avascular tumor spheroid with diffusion-limited growth and uh, the idea of a basal metabolism and how the uptake and diffusion length of uh, a critical limiting nutrient could lead to different rates of tumor growth and morphologies. And then uh, we started last week on uh, talking about what's called taxis, how cells respond by moving in, to gradients in their environment. Uh, typically in copter cell or physicist cell, we have a concept of a chemical field and so cells move in response to that a chemical field, but uh, cells can move in response to a lot of other gradients as well. They can re respond to the stiffness of substrates. They can respond to gravity, temperature, light, pH, mechanical stress and strain in the environment and so on. The basic assumption that, that multicellular modeling frameworks use is that at the simplest level, uh, cells move as if the field were exerting a force on the cell. Now, in reality, the way cells move in response to force, in response to external gradients is quite complicated. But very often, uh, the cells move essentially with a velocity, at least for small concentrations of gradients, that's proportional to the gradient of the, of the thing that they're measuring. And so then in that case, you could write uh, effectively an effective force that's uh, constant times the gradient of the concentration. In reality, again, there's going to be a lot more complexity, but it's a zeroth order uh, approximation that simplistic simplification will actually get you quite far. 
Last time we focused on uh, using uh, the CC3D ML specification for chemotaxis. Uh, there's a plugin called chemotaxis. We need to specify uh, the uh, diffusion solver we use. Typically we use diffusion solver FE, but you might be using something like reaction diffusion solver or something else. You need the name of the chemical or the field in general that you're using. And then you need to say, uh, as always in the XML, it's typically by type for a cell of type such and such, what is the strength of the chemical uh, response? Lambda equals something. Uh, and then there are a number of options, one of which is chemotact towards, which says only surfaces that are in contact between amoeba and medium respond to the chemical, which is often true uh, in biology. And another one, which we'll come back to a little bit later uh, in this class, I hope, is, is uh, scaling, log-scale coefficient, uh, where you say that for large concentrations, the response is different from that for small concentrations. And we built a linear gradient model uh, of cubitaxis, where we had a cubitaxis cell at a linear gradient. And we showed that uh, at least for small values of lambda kibo, uh, that uh, velocity of the cell was proportional to the uh, lambda chemo. Uh, and for large values of lambda chemo, the cell velocity reached a maximum. And Giuliano, I don't know, did you put that, uh, your code into the demos folder? Your, your cell races code. Hit. So Giuliano is going to put the, his demo where he has multiple channels, multiple tracks uh, with different uh, hemotaxis parameters for the same cell type. Uh, and that is a great way of seeing that some cells move faster than others and how that uh, velocity behaves. Uh, that simulation is a little more complicated, so, so I wouldn't try to replicate it yourself. It might be a good homework problem, but I don't want to make it too, uh, too demanding here. And that demo is in the demos for student materials, linear chemotaxis 2, and people are going to need it a little bit later. So if you want to download that to your computers, if you don't have it from last time, I recommend that you do that. So the next thing that I want to do is come back uh, to a critical biological concept, uh, which is called a self-constructed gradient. And so in the, first, in the first example that we did, we had an external chemical field that chemical field was constant and imposed on the cell. And that, that certainly happens. Uh, there are plenty of situations in which the external field is essentially dominated by things happening a long way away from the cell and the cell's movement and behaviors only perturb the field a little bit. Although as we saw in the case of the, of the uh, tumor growth, if the cells that are in a growing tumor are taking up oxygen, for example, from the environment, they change the oxygen field not only within the tumor, but also in the environment around the tumor. And so depending on how the cell is responding to the external gradient, uh, it might effectively do very little, change that external gradient very little. Um, if, it's if a cell is crawling on a mechanical substrate and it's responding to the stiffness of the substrate, uh, the, the cell is not going to change how stiff the substrate is usually. On the other hand, if the cell is detecting a chemical that's present in the environment by absorbing that chemical, uh, say the cell is looking for glucose in the environment and it's moving towards higher concentrations of glucose, the cell's using up the glucose as it's moving and therefore the gradient will change as the cell moves. And it's pretty common uh, for cells to do that. Uh, glucose and bacteria would be one example of that. Another one, which may be slightly less obvious if you're not a developmental biologist, but it's quite important in, in development, wound healing, and also in cancer metastasis, is that quite often uh, the chemical that the cells are following is not freely diffusing. Uh, it's bound to the extracellular matrix. And so this is a chemical that's essentially sequestered 
uh, in the environment. And I'm trying to think of some, I'm gonna come up because I'm too old, I'm afraid. I'll come up with some terrible analogy. I guess I'm trying to think of something like an item drop in a, in a video game of a dungeon uh, where there's some resources uh, in, the, in the dungeon that you're pursuing. When you, shoot, when you use them, they're gone. And so then you have to move to another place for that, to find the next resource. Um, and that, that's a surprisingly common thing, of course, in, the, in environmental systems. Uh, if an animal uh, eats all of the resources in a given region, it has to move to another region to find resources. Uh, so we're used to that, but that happens also in the context of, of normal development. Uh, quite often, uh, growth factors in the environment are bound to the extracellular matrix. But when the cell detects those, when it measures them, it actually internalizes them. And so those signals are, 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 are destroyed. And that in itself creates a gradient. And then the cell will move in response to that gradient. So you can start out with a, a situation in which the concentration of the chemical is uniform everywhere. And the cell itself creates the gradient it responds to. Uh, and this is uh, particularly important uh, in uh, vascular development, and it's also important in a neural crest cell migration in, in early development. And one of the things that's interesting about it is it can lead to uh, movement of cells that's coherent, that persists much, much longer than the diffusion length of the molecular signal. And so I'd like to have people do a little exercise on this. Um, and so here's what I would like you to do. Um, I'd like you to initialize the simulation. You can make it 100 by 100 uh, by one, give it periodic boundary conditions. You don't want things getting stuck to the edge of your simulation. You can create a single cell type. You could call it amoeba or bacteria. And a single chemical field, you could call it nutrient or oxygen, if you like. Um, give the cell a contact energy or chemotaxis term and a volume constraint. And then uh, you could start out by setting the global diffusion and decay constants to zero. That is, the, the, the chemical in the environment is fixed in the environment. And the cell specific diffusion constant could be something small, 0.001. The decay coefficient could be 0.01. That'll give you cell uptake. Uh, we could do actually uptake um, by the cell and measuring and other things, but we'll do this as simply as possible. Uh, use the concentration field boundary conditions to be one to be periodic. Initial chemical concentration to be one everywhere. Try lambda chemotaxis of 200, and start with a single cell in the center of simulation, and then run it. And I want to hear what people find. And this, this is actually a very rich simulation. Uh, if you have multiple cells, the way they interact is quite interesting. Uh, if you have a source of the chemical so that the amount of chemical in the environment gradually recovers after cells have absorbed it, uh, that gives you some interesting results. All of those things do occur in various biological contexts. Uh, and so uh, there's really quite a bit to explore. So. If you, if you do this problem and you get uh, through it quickly compared to your classmates, I, I strongly encourage you to try multiple initial cells, make the cells stick to each other, or repel each other, um, include uh, secretion of the chemical by medium uh, to restore the amount of chemical to its original value, um, uh, change lambda chemo, uh, you can really get a, a, an amazing variety of dynamics uh, with this uh, very, very simple model. Are there any questions about the, that little assignment? And if you get stuck uh, in that demo folder, uh, there is a, uh, I see there's a typo, I think. Uh, there's a demo called Self-Constructed Gradient, uh, which has my version of the code got an extra R and constructed. Unless I type the name, actually, the name of the, of, of the code wrong, I have to check. Uh, but why don't you give it a try? Because it's you, essentially almost everything you need is in wizard. You don't have to do very much beyond wizard.
the main thing you'll have to do beyond wizard is is uh, edit the uh, blob initializer to create the one cell to begin with and then uh, the boundary conditions for the diffusion field okay that looks good do you have the do you have the xml let's take a look at the xml together and see how you did it So you have a cell, a cell type called amoeba, uh, diffusion coefficient of 0.01, decay coefficient of 0.01, fine. Um, and now you have the amoeba secreting the chemical. And that's interesting, but to begin with, I wouldn't do that. We could make that zero if you like. And then I'd recommend trying periodic boundary conditions. That probably will work because I think the periodic will overwrite the constant value, but probably better mm -hmm. not to do that. Just take these out. Yeah. Okay, okay that one looks, uh, and that one definitely won't work. You want that one to be just the periodic. Okay, good. And now let's see what else you got. Let's try running that and see what happens. Okay, so now you have no, no chemical. So let's look at the initial condition for your chemical. So where do you set the initial condition? Would be in the in the diffusion solver. Be line sixty four. Whoops. <laughs> okay. Try that. Okay. So now you're digging a hole, and look what the cells are doing. Goodness. So, so why don't we start with just one cell? So let's go in into the the blob initializer and start with just one cell and see how that behaves. And then it's definitely interesting to see what you happens when you get a cluster of them. So make your your radius uh, approximately half of the the width. There you go. There we go. Now, if you let that, you notice that that, that little cell is, there's the, the initial pattern is symmetrical, so there's no direction for the cell. It picks one randomly. What do you notice about the way that cell's moving? Are you asking me specifically? Well, anybody. <laughs> is there something you notice about about what the cell does? Is the movement it, completely random? It looks like it's avoiding its previous path. Exactly. It's, a, <laughs> it's, it's what's called the self-avoiding random walk. It's not a perfect self-avoiding random walk. If it really gets cornered in, it'll cross itself. But it's trying to avoid its previous path. Great, great observation. And you see it's finding, it's doing a pretty good job of finding all that nutrient, right? It's going around chewing it up. Eventually it'll get stuck. You'll run out of nutrient everywhere and then it will, it will stop moving. So you see it's, it's chasing all of that red, chewing it up. It's a little bit hard not to anthropomorphize these cells and say it's trying to do this or it's. Uh... So 
So actually, in terms of a resource seeking, this is not a bad way for an organism to, to explore its environment. It can get stuck. I mean, it could build a, it could basically get stuck in a desert, uh, at which point it'll never come back. Uh, but in this case, it's actually doing a pretty good job. Did anybody else get something similar or did somebody get something very different? Yeah, I can't get my cells to move, maybe. Okay, do you want a screen like share and let's look at that together? Yeah. It's sort of a fun demo, isn't it? I, I really, I, 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 uh, I really like watching that cell do. It's, it's, uh, and as I say, if you have multiple cells and change the diffusion a little bit, you can get all sorts of different patterns of behavior. Okay, so let's take a look. So what happens first if you run it by itself? Cell disappears. Okay, so let's take a look at your code. See if we can see what's going on. Yeah. Okay, so does anybody see what the issue is? Is the volume plug in? I don't have anything. Right. Yeah. That that if you're going to, so if you're going to do it that way, if you're going to use the volume plug in that way, you'd have to specify it in Python. You'd have to specify the volume in Python. If you if you go to the CC3DML pull down menu. And you just go to plugins and you go volume. It will replace, you could say replace, and that'll give you what you need. Okay. You may want to change the values a little bit, but that's a, that's a start. Let's see what happens. Well, it's still okay, so you're gonna to have to make it a little stiffer. So, so let's um, instead of making the the lambda volume two, make it six. Or I guess Juliana, you like eight, right? Eight. Make it eight for Juliana's. See what happens. Okay. So that cell is pretty fuzzed out. Do you have a contact energy turned on? Oh, I think I forgot to have contact energy, yeah. It's actually sort of an interesting pattern that you've got. I've never seen that one. Uh, and now it got stuck. So let's see about contact energy. I can do that here, right? And the default should be all right. Huh. Did it not load the new? Oh, yeah. I wonder why it's split. It's on. Sorry. Why don't you try turning up the cell medium contact energy a little bit? So it'd be bacterium medium, you say 15, 20, make it. If that doesn't change something, then somehow the player isn't loading the new, you know. Looks like player's not loading the new simulator. Oh, it's stuck now, so it did change. What's the temperature? What's the fluctuation amplitude? How do I check that again? At uh, the top of your simulation? 10, yeah. Uh, it should be all right. Giuliano, any ideas what's happening here? Mm. Yeah, you might want to make neighbor order in line 38 4 instead of in line 38. Oh, 38. Make that uh, 3 or 4. 
instead of one. The fault of one is a little awkward. For me. There we go. So now maybe it's a little too stiff. So now we have to turn down that contact energy again, instead of making it. Oh, I okay. So it's probably secreting. Let's look at let's look at the chemical uh, field specification. Okay, so again, people are getting stuck because the default is that the cell secretes, but you don't want it to be doing that. So now try that. There you go. Yeah, it's working now. Thank you. It's this slow probably because of the high contact energy, right? That's possible. It's also, um, let's see, I don't know why. No, I think, no, it's getting stuck. My guess is it's just hanging up because of Zoom interactions with the, with player. Oh, okay. Because if you look at the if you look at the Monte Carlo steps in the bottom left hand corner of your display, you'll see it'll it's getting it's stopping it's getting stuck it's moving and then it'll it'll hang up. But yeah, your cell there, your cell is crawling around exploring. Now yeah, it's stuck. Not sure why it's getting stuck. It's moving. Yeah, for me, I think it's just yeah, it's right. delayed. Okay, so one thing, why don't you try, let's do something. Let's, why don't you try um, going into the initial condition and let's create more than one cell. See what that does. So go into blob initializer, make radius a bit bigger, make it say 20. And let's put the cells separated. Well, you could have them together first, but uh, yeah, make this. Okay, I can make a gap. Yeah, that would be great. Oh, perfect. See what that does. Okay. So these cells are basically migrating as one huge cell. And that's actually a rather interesting simulation in its own right. Um, we were simulating, say, dictyostelium discoidium, the ones where I showed you the chemotaxis. That wouldn't be a bad simulation of that, where that aggregate of, of multiple cluster, uh, cluster of sub cells is actually behaving like a single cell. Uh, one thing you could do here would be to make the cells repel each other. And so if you go into the contact energy and you make the cell medium contact energy smaller, so that the um, the cells prefer to be surrounded by medium. So instead of making that 20, make that, there we go. See what that does. Okay. Mm. So now they stay separated from each other and wander exploring the environment. Great. Does anybody else have something they want to show? Thank you. There's one more, one more small thing you can do with the simulation that makes is quite interesting, which is to add, um, to add, uh, the recovery of the background concentration. And maybe let's just do that together. If you go into the if you go into the diffusion solver again, and now we say that there's going to be secretion, but not secretion by the bacterium. We're going to have medium secrete. So we'll say secretion type. Um, there we go, medium. But it will change from bacteria to medium.
I think you need a, I think you need a capital M. Man. Okay. Now, if we just, that's fine. Just that, that, that one, but that, that one by itself is all you need. Now, the one thing you're going to have to do here is if you have secretion in the background, um, that will, well, if you try that, what you'll see is that the, the concentration will blow up. So why don't we just run that by itself? As a, as a principle, I believe in changing one thing at a time and seeing why it fails. And so if you look at the, if you look at the maximum concentration, you'll see it's going boom. And the cells are blowing up too because the chemical field is so large. And so then you can remember something that we talked about uh, a little bit, but was not, we didn't emphasize so much, which is that the uh, equilibrium concentration is the secretion rate divided by the decay rate. And our decay rate is zero here. In the, in the global decay constant. And so in that case, the, the secretion rate and the decay rate, were, are, yeah, that'll bring you back to one. Now, if both of those values are 0.1, the time scale is very fast. The time scale, remember, is one over the decay rate, 10 Monte Carlo steps. And so effectively, in this case, the background concentration is one, and the cells aren't gonna do much because the background field basically recovers instantly. So the cells dig themselves a hole and they stay in the hole. If you divide those by a thousand, make it 1.01, you have to do the same thing for the secretion rate. There we go. Um, now, now you should get something that's a little more interesting. Yeah, it's a little frustrating that it keeps hanging up on you, but I think you'll see if we're patient, we'll see that the concentration, right? Before the trails were permanent, the trails left behind by the, 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 the cells <coughs> were there forever. Now over a period of about a thousand Monte Carlo steps, the chemical comes back. <coughs> and so in one case, there was a fixed amount of nutrient in the environment. In this case, there's a steady supply, a low but steady supply of nutrient in the environment. And the degree to which the cells avoid each other is going to be tuned by that. If the recovery time is fast, then the cells won't avoid each other so much. And so you can play with this game. So there are a bunch of games you can play. You could change the adhesion between the cells. You can change the strength of the chemical response. You could change the recovery time of the chemical field in the background. You could change the fraction of the, the chemical the cells take up. So there are quite a few, uh, quite a few fun games that one you can that you can play. In the case of a fixed amount of chemical, once the cells have eaten all of it, they stop moving. In this case, they'll keep moving because you're always putting new chemical into the environment. Anybody else have a problem with this or want to show us something that's uh, that's interesting? I can't get it to spawn just one cell. Um, when I'm using the XML, if I set the, um, sorry, I always get them mixed up in my head, but if I set the radius to half or less than the width, then nothing spawns. Okay, let's take a look together. Okay, let's take a look together. This is the um, XML file. Sorry. And I have radius set to nine, my width to 20. And I've commented commented out the secretion by the cell. Um, I have all my global diffusion constants off. I have my chemotaxis on. And then I define volume in the steppables. And when I 
hit play, or when I like start it, nothing appears. Well, that's done with those two. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see. Well, one thing is your target volume is is. Well, one uh, thing is your target volume is is uh, twenty five, and your initial cell size is limited by twenty. Your initial cell size is limited by twenty. Is I'm sorry, you cut out there. What did you say? Is is what by twenty? So you're asking for you're saying that this the so cells you're are asking for you're saying that this the cells is and so you're but you're you're trying to make the cell five by five that's your your target size of the cell is five by five but you're giving it a width of twenty so that would be an initial volume of four hundred so why not try making that five. And then another thing you might want to try would be to um, make the cells a little bit stiffer. There you go. So make the make the uh, make the um, the lambda volume instead of making it two, make it six or eight. So they don't. And and if you specify, uh, let's see what the vo are using the volume. Let's see the volume constraint in your XML in the XML, so scroll up. So, okay, so you are specifying volume only in Python, that's fine. So let's look in the, let's look in your Python. And yeah, make it six, there we go, that should be good. Try that. Okay, so, so, the cell is surviving now. That's good. Thank you. Okay. And, and you, in this case, you don't have periodic boundary conditions. So the cell, which is fine, but the cell is coming to the edge and getting stuck, can't cross the edge. Which is probably more realistic for the real world. If you're out there, you have know, uh, boundary conditions in one direction, but maybe not in the other direction. That would be in not in the in that would be in the uh, in the Python. That's okay. Yes, you want periodic periodic for the chemical, and then also for the uh, for the lattice itself. So you want that to be periodic. That to be periodic. And then also scroll up to the top where you specify the cell field. And you have uh, periodic in Y, but not periodic in X in line 18. Right on. There you go. Runs pretty you, fast on your computer. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Please go ahead. Um, so mine works, but I can check my screen. I thought that's easier. So when I run it, you may you may have. To, uh, you may have to screen share the oh there you got play okay good okay great okay. it moves but it's not like actually eating the nutrient okay so look at the bottom of your nutrient field where it says min and max you no know, in the in player let's look at oh, the okay. at the bottom there Notice those two numbers. Min is the minimum concentration. Max is the maximum concentration. What are the numbers? Both zero. Right. So, so you it means you didn't create an initial chemical for it to eat. Okay. So let's go back to the XML. 
And let's look at the initial condition. And it looks like you've got it value of one. So I wonder why it's not setting that value. Does anybody see what's going on? Nutrient, nutrient. Hmm. Can you try running it again? Let's see. Yeah. I hope it's not a. Oh, but Alma, you're on a PC, right? You're on a line. Oh, well. Okay, so maybe it's a Linux. Because it's not setting the initial value. Because I've been having issues with my copy cell, just like to begin with. Um, okay, well, you're in 4.2.5. I think there's a newer version that should be available that maybe fix some of these problems. Okay. Um, but let's just try one thing. Can you go into the go into the uh, diffusion solver and make the diffusion constant, the global diffusion constant, something like 0 0.001. Just give it, make it small but non-zero. Okay, that's fine. No. Huh. Juliano, is there a, a bug with CompuCell for, for 4.2.5 for the Mac for diffusion? Hmm. Is anybody else using a Mac and having a problem with this? I'm using a Mac too, but I haven't had a problem with and which version of CompuCell are you running? If you go under help, it'll tell you which version. I'm using the same version. Hmm. All right. Well, then maybe there's something obvious in quotation marks that we're missing. Let's take a look at the XML again. Usually, I'm pretty good at second guessing these things, but once in a while, you beat me. Um, Degression periodic. Could it be because the initial concentration? Periodic, periodic. Could it be because the initial concentration expression is written as a float right now? That should be all right. Um, that should be all right. Can you scroll down a little bit and let's look at the just the rest of the everything looks normal to me. Elmer asked the question, are you sure you saved it before you reran it? Yeah, I did. If I didn't save it, it would be right up here. Okay. Because I was okay. comparing it to the code that you um right. posted for us, and it's pretty much the same, right. except for like a couple of different things. Well, the code I had had a bug because I clobbered the, the, the chemotaxis plugin by mistake when I was editing. I was trying to clean it up for you and I, I introduced an error. Uh, but this one, I'm really puzzled by why the field is showing zero. Let's try something. Let's, let's actually have the cell secrete. Turn on the secretion okay. in line 73 and see if... Uh, I just want to see, I want to see some chemical in that field. I'm, I'm puzzled by why it's, um, by why it's not uh, giving us any chemical. Huh. I mean, that really looks like there's no, well, oh, there's no, where did the cell, where did you lose your, your cell disappeared? So why did the cell disappear? Let's start with that. Let's get the cell back. So let's look at the the uh, volume constraint. Where's the volume? The volume constraint. Um, lambda volume target volume. That should be okay. 
Embroider. Maybe make Lambda volume eight there, but um, it shouldn't be doing anything. But the, the cell should definitely not disappear on you. Uh, can we look in the Python? See if you have it. I mean, there shouldn't really be any Python here, but let's just look at the Python. Python isn't. Oh, I know what it is. Ha <laughs> ha. You've got you've got a tracking field with the same name as the chemical. That's what it is. Oh. So that's what happened. Yeah, CompuCell may, probably should warn you if this is happening, but it, it's getting confused because you have. It should raise an error instead of there you go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. That would that thank you. That, that I should be more aware of that as a possible problem. If you if you if you have two fields with the same name, CompuCell will not tell, warn you that there's a problem. But but that second field will be zero because it won't it you weren't writing anything into it. And in general, uh, Python code is executed after the XML. And so if you create a field named nutrient in XML and then create another field called nutrient in Python, the Python one will overwrite the one that you created in the XML. Okay, good to know. Thank you. So that should be that should have been you're right. That should be that should be trapped. Good. Thank you for that. Anybody else have something that problem or something they want to show? I think I really appreciate people walking through these and and uh, Trying to do some joint debugging on this. That's good. All right. Okay. Great. Is the screen share okay for people? Take it back. All right. So um, I had a little walkthrough of how to do this. Um, again, uh, you have to change the, uh, the chemotaxis plugin, and you have to change the the chemical field specification a little bit. And these are the typical simulations that I got. If one were really, if you're more ambitious, and I don't think we'll do this today, but it could be a good homework problem. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is to plot the center of mass trajectory of the cell. Um, in this case, again, since the since you can see the trajectory, if there's no recovery, uh, you don't need to plot that so much. But if you have multiple cells, that's pretty interesting. And if you want to be a little bit more ambitious, it's interesting to ask the question, <clears throat> what's the persistence length of the cell? In other words, when the cell is moving in a given direction, Eventually, it'll turn into different directions. But what's the typical distance it goes in a particular direction before it changes direction, which is called the persistence length? Uh, and uh, that's a that's a rather interesting number, which is very important to the ability of the cell to find nutrient in its environment. And we haven't gone into the mathematics of that, but if you if you were to look that up online. Or maybe chat GPT, you could say, please calculate the persistence length of a migrating cell in, in, uh, in a CompuCell plugin. Mm -hmm. uh, CompuCell steppable, I should say. Uh, it might work. Uh, we, we were quite impressed the other day. We asked it to, to give us a CompuCell steppable uh, to calculate the contact area between cells of different kinds in chat GPT, and it gave the right code. And... Uh, I'm not, as I say, I'm not surprised when I when I ask it for say, give me a find the find the prime numbers in C because people do that a lot. So there's that's available on the web. But the fact that it actually knew the call structure in the APIs for CompuCell, how to do imports and things like that, actually impressed me quite a bit. Uh, so uh, and presumably, presumably because it's chat GPT three. Uh, it'll be an older version of CompuCell, uh, so it might give you some some old APIs. But I, I was uh, 
I'm, I, I definitely would not criticize you if you said in your homework that you use chat GPT to generate your code. Uh, I try it yourself first, but uh, if, if, if chat GPT will do it, that's great. The only thing I regret about chat GPT is it doesn't learn. Uh, Giuliano says it's good that it doesn't learn, but, but I think if, if, it, if if, if you ask, keep asking questions and correcting it, that should be, it should be self-improving. Anyway, uh, good. Yeah. So um, we did already did some of these additional exercises. Um, one which we didn't try was adding a small diffusion constant to the chemical field that fuzzes out the trails a little bit and it makes it easier for the cells to cross their tails. And if you uh, make the diffusion constant in the background large enough, and this is something maybe somebody could try, or I could maybe show you. If you make the diffusion constant long enough, I guess this will be a homework problem for you. Uh, you'll see that there'll be a difference. The, 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 the way the cells move will change dramatically as you increase the diffusion constant. And so it's rather interesting to play that game. Uh, we tried already uh, the example of adding a small rate of secretion by medium and adding a small global decay. And, and what we found was that if the, that uh, secretion rate was slow, uh, things were basically the way they started. But uh, if you made the secretion rate too fast, basically the, the gradients didn't give you enough uh, information for the cell to be able to explore the environment. And so there are a whole, a whole bunch of really interesting problems so one can play with this. And again, I want to emphasize that, that this isn't just a game. Uh, it's, it's actually very important uh, for long range migration. Uh, you, it's very hard to create long range gradients in tissues. Uh, because the diffusion length of a typical chemical, as we talked about, a typical morphogen is on the order of 50 to 100 microns. And so that means you can't really build a gradient that goes more than a, a few hundred microns. And so if you want to get a cell to move across a centimeter, a gradient can't do it by itself. Uh, but this kind of mechanism allows the basically the cell to create a gradient and keep moving in the same direction. You get something, a, a small gradient to start the cell in a given direction that keeps moving in that direction. Elmer, yes. So Elmer asks, can we use the, the moment of inertia, uh, which is basically a cell elongation uh, to control the cell? Um, the cell here that we've got is essentially isotropic. It's more or less round. Uh, when, when we saw the example where we had a cluster of subcells, that were acting as if they were one big cell stuck to each other. You saw the cell had a rather distinctive shape, sort of a palm shape, looked like this a little bit. Uh, if you look at actually a uh, keratinocyte crawling, it takes that shape. And, and uh, Leah Keshet has some nice papers uh, where she explores that particular shape of a cell crawling in a cell contracted gradient. And so, so definitely you could uh, affect the way the cell crawls by changing its shape. Yeah. yeah. So. So, so Elmer says, makes a point, which is that, that uh, the terminology in, in, in the, Hold on one sec, let me check something. So now the inertia tensor is is in, in, in XML, I just wanted to check for myself because it's not one I use very often, uh, is, is primarily for control of cell shape. Now in the, uh, in the subcellular world, in the, in the microscopic world of cells, uh, there really is not much inertia. In other words, if I, there's a classic 
a calculation you do in a biophysics class, which says if you have a bacterium that's swimming and it stops rotating its flagellum, how long does the cell coast before it stops moving? And the answer is about the diameter of a nucleus of an atom. It stops essentially instantaneously. Uh, and so there's essentially no inertia at the scale of a cell. The dissipation, the drag due to, due, due to uh, the fluid the cells in is so great that if the cell's not actively moving, it doesn't keep moving. Now in a fluid like blood, where you have uh, a large amount of fluid flowing in the aorta, then you have inertia. But at the scale of an individual cell, essentially, unless the cell is actively pushing itself, it stops immediately. Um, there used to be actually a plug-in in CompuCell that did, in fact, enforce inertia uh, in the movement. It was an autocorrelation on the velocity of the cell. And one can do that uh, in the current version of CompuCell by hand. We should probably put that back in as a plug-in. In which case you can make the, the movement more Newtonian. But the but the inertia plug-in for this is about the shape of the cell rather than the movement of the cell. Ah, okay. So if I get to the last part of this lecture, I will show you how to do that. Uh, uh, Elmer, Elmer asks, um, how do I, if I want to put a force, an explicit force on a cell to keep the cell moving in a given direction, how do I do it? And there is, in fact, a way of doing this is explicit force calculation. Uh, in, in the XML, it's called, I mean, in the Python, it's called Um, let's see, where is it? I'm getting, I'm, I'm, my, my screen, the, 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 the font size is so small, I'm having trouble reading it. I'll, I'll show, I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you in a bit. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Elmer. That was good. Okay. So let me talk about Python and chemotaxis. As usual in CompuCell, um, if we want to uh, you specify uh, behaviors on individual cells rather than on all cells of a given type, uh, we have to do that in Python. Also, as usual, you need to make the chemotaxis plugin a bare plugin. You just load the chemotaxis plugin with no attribute. The one thing perhaps that's a little bit inconvenient is you might want uh, chemotaxis by cells for some chemical fields and chemotaxis by cell types for others. And I don't think you can do that. I don't think you have the flexibility to do that. I think it's all or nothing. Giuliano, is that? I don't think, I think, I think I tried it and it doesn't work. So you'd load the bare chemotaxis plugin and then the manipulation within the in the Python is a little bit uh, a little bit awkward, uh, but not terrible. The first thing you have to do is get a reference uh, to the information on the cell that couples the cell to the chemical field that you're interested in. And so here I have an example, which is CD equals self dot chemotaxis plugin add chemotaxis data, and then the idea of the cell, and then the name of the field. So that's coupling the cell and the field name to each other. Once I have that reference to the chemotaxis data, I can set the parameters, for example, cd.set lambda, and then give it a lambda chemotaxis. And then I can change the value of lambda chemo and I can change other parameters. So. 
The reason the syntax is a little bit more complicated is because I have two things that I have to associate. I have to associate my particular cell with the chemical field it's going to respond to. So I have two, two arguments. Okay. So uh, here, I was going to suggest you take that linear chemotaxis uh, code and uh, try taking that simulation we wrote last week and use this new code uh, approach to change the value of lambda chemo in the simulation. And ideally, what you'd want to do is every, every so often you would change lambda chemo uh, and do something to keep the cell from, from leaving the simulation. Uh, this is actually a rather complicated um, exercise, and so I'm, I'm not going to ask you to do all of it. Um, let me show you the code that I've got um, instead. There's a, a, a finished version of this code, which is chemotaxis dependence on parameter. And let me open that up for you and, uh, and show it to you. And we can see, uh, first I'll show it to you running. People can, can try running it. This one I, I did check to make sure that it ran. So let's see if it runs. I'm going to give you a new share. Fortunately, the way I've got things set up, I can't do a desktop share. Let me first show you the code here. And what you'll see here is I have Well, let's see. Let me try. Let me be better better run it. And make sure it works before I say. Why is this not letting me? You know, stop this screen share. Stop. Hmm. Juliano, can you try to get that up? I'm having a our usual issue with with uh, pipe with CompuCell and and uh, Zoom not not playing nice to each other. I don't want to keep people waiting too long. Okay, I got it. So what I have here is a cell. And at the moment, you can't see the gradient. Let me see if I can display the gradient for you. Okay, let me show you the chemical field here. Okay, so the cell is in a fixed chemical field. And you see the cell is moving. The screen share showing correctly. You're seeing the chemical, seeing the player. The cell is yeah, moving. Okay, cell is moving. And what I'm doing is the cell, when, I, when the cell gets too, either after a certain amount of time, because I'm impatient, or when the cell gets too close to either end, 
I flip the sign of the lambda chemo so that it starts going in the other direction. Each time I do that, I measure the velocity of the cell, the mean velocity of the cell. And after a certain number of repetitions, because I'm going to average because it's noisy, after a certain number of repetitions, I change the value of lambda chemo. And then I plot the mean velocity versus lambda chemo. So if I look in the top, so so if I look in the in the in the in the uh, cell field, I see the cell moving back and forth. You'll see as the lambda chemo gets big, the cell gets sort of broken up, which is where it is now. If I look in the velocity field, you'll see that the velocities are getting bigger and bigger as I go through this. In the center of mass, I'm actually plotting the trajectory of the cell as a function of time, so I could see when it turns around. And the oscillations get a little bit bigger as I increase lambda chemo. And then velocity versus parameter is on the x-axis, the strength of lambda chemo, and the y-axis, the mean velocity. And remember that one of our assignments by hand was to ask the question, how does the velocity of the cell scale when I change lambda chemo? And we said that for small values of velocity, uh, the velo small, small values of lambda chemo, the velocity increased linearly with lambda chemo, which you can see here. And then as, the, as lambda chemo gets bigger, there's a saturation and there's a speed limit. The cell can't go faster than some limit, which is typically about a tenth of a pixel per Monte Carlo step. Here it's actually a little bigger, about a fourth of a pixel per Monte Carlo step. So do, does that does that does that what the simulation is doing make sense to people? Any questions about how that what what it's doing here? So let me then switch and show you the code for this. And the Python part of it, let's look at so the XML part of it is going to look pretty familiar to people, I think. Okay, the XML, does everybody see the code now? Okay. So the XML looks very familiar. The volume is specified in Python. Hemataxis here actually is specified initially in the XML. And then I'm going to override it in the Python. And then the diffusion solver, I have an initial linear gradient. No diffusion, so I'm just imposing a chemical field. And now if I go to my Python, uh, this Python winds up being fairly elaborate. And the reason it's fairly elaborate here is mainly because I want to be able to change a lot of parameters. Um, and so, for example, uh, I have the initial value of the uh, lambda chemo, the maximum value, um, whether it goes up in linear steps or logarithmic steps. And so, but the key thing is that I'm going to do uh, the steps that I showed you in, in the slide. Here, I'm adding hemataxis to the cell. And the name of the chemical field is ATTR. And then I'm setting the lambda chemo for the cell here from its initial value. I have a bunch of plots that are going to report all the things that we talked about. And then uh, initially, I add the position of the cell as a function of time. So that's that zigzag that we plotted. Um, if I run out of time, or if the cell gets too close to the edge, I flip the sign of the uh, lambda chemo. And after I count, here we go, flip the sign of lambda chemo. And if the a number of times I've gone back and forth is enough, 
I do something called flip count, how many times I've gone back and forth because I want to average over that. And if the number of times I've done it is enough, then I either add or multiply uh, the value of lambda chemo uh, by some fixed amount. Now this, this kind of code and, and is something that you can use. Again, the, 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 it's, not, it's not difficult code per se, but it's a little bit finicky to get it all to work. And so I wouldn't wouldn't expect you to be writing that. That could be you know, for, for a project, for a semester project, that level of code is reasonable. I wouldn't expect you to write that level of code in a homework assignment. Uh, but one thing that you can do with this code, which can be sort of fun, is here we change lambda chemo. So you can say, how fast does the cell move as I change lambda chemo? But a reasonable thing I could ask you to do would be to say, Instead of changing lambda chemo, what if I change the size of the cell every step? Uh, if I have the same lambda chemo, does a larger cell move faster or slower? So that would be something that you could try out. Or if I change la the strength of the volume constraint, la vo uh, lambda volume, does that slow the cell down or speed it up? And so this, this little code, uh, allows you to change by just changing the line where you change the value, you could change any property of the cell and see how that that the change of property changes the behavior. Any any comments or questions about that? I I realize that, that I, I I've got an exercise here which I as I say I think I think in the interest of time we'll skip. But I think it's worth having people. Elmer, go ahead. So Elmer says, ask the question, what determines how fast the cell moves? Is it the dominant term in the effective energy or something else. And that's actually a little bit tricky question to answer. It, it depends, for example, when you're doing chemotaxis, it depends on the type of chemotaxis you're doing, whether changing the size of the cell makes the cell move the same speed faster or slower. Um, in general, when you make the lambda volume of a cell bigger, the cell moves less, period. So that one, as you increase lambda volume, you should see that the cell slows down. If you increase the contact energy of the cell with the medium, uh, that also will probably make the cell slow down. Effectively, the cell is being, the, the medium is resisting the cell's movement a little bit more. But the volume is tricky. The volume may, depending on how things are set, it may make no difference. It may increase the, the velocity or decrease. And so that's a, that's a game one can play that I think is a rather, could be quite interesting. And I think, I think it's worth, uh, it's worth uh, trying that out. So I hope people, I mean, it's sort of, I can, I can give it, maybe leave it up to the room. I mean, if people would like to try one small exercise uh, using this code, uh, we can take 10 minutes to do that, uh, or we can keep going. So it's a little bit. Maybe we should keep going today. I think, I think I'd like to keep. I'd like to keep going. But but you have the code, and I, I would encourage you to try this at home. Um, maybe Giuliano can come up with a little homework exercise using that code to do that, because there's a lot to explore. And so here's the re typical result. Um, again, uh, if lambda chemo is, is, is too small, the cell doesn't move very much at all, then uh, lambda chemo for a large range, uh, the cell velocity is basically linear in the value of lambda chemo. And if lambda chemo is too big, the cell moves with a constant velocity. In this case, uh, in the particular one that I've got here, 
I've changed the settings so that it only goes, it changes the velocity, it changes lambda chemo after a single oscillation instead of after some number. So it's a little bit noisy. Okay. So the other thing that I wanted to come back to, and I, I'd like people to get that linear gradient uh, simulation running again, is that, and I, and, and I am screen sharing the slides, right? I want to make sure that, okay, good. Having, having occasionally made, made mistakes where, where I was talking for half an hour with a black screen, uh, uh, when, when I'm in my home office, I have two screens, so I can see what's screen shared uh, separately from the Zoom. But here I can't, so it's, it's possible for me to make a mistake. That way. Um, so one thing that, that can happen uh, in biological reality is that in a, in a linear gradient, we can adjust the strength of lambda chemo so that the cell moves with a typical velocity that we want. But if we have decay, we know that the concentration of the chemical is not linear in position, it goes down exponentially. And in an exponential field, the gradient is very steep near the source of the chemical and very shallow far away. And so what I'd like people to do is to create, take that linear gradient simulation and add a decay term to the chemical field and then see how the cell moves. And what you should see is that if the cell starts out far away from the source of the chemical, it sees almost no chemical, so it barely moves. And you sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, and wait and nothing happens. And then it'll move at a reasonable speed as it's in intermediate concentration. And then when it gets too close to the source of the chemical, the forces are so strong that the cell either gets torn apart or disappears. Now, in reality, cells uh, don't behave that way. Typically, once you get to a typical, a, mean, a reasonable level of the chemical, the cell's velocity is independent of the concentration. And, uh, The certainly strong concentrations don't don't make the cell fall apart. And so one of the things that we want to do is be able to do deal with that, and that's called um, adaptation. And in the older versions of CompuCell code, we would do this in Python, and we would change the strength of lambda chemo based on the chemical field strength. And that works. But CompuCell now actually has in the XML um, a way of doing this. And so let's do this exercise. And after we do this exercise, we'll take a short break. So, so I'd like you to take that linear gradient simulation. Uh, and if you remember the linear gradient simulation, we had no decay coefficient. And I'd like you to uh, set the decay coefficient to Point oh 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 one, the one ten thousand. And if you do that, uh, the initial condition that we had before was a linear initial condition, which isn't what we need. So what you want to do is set the initial condition to be the equilibrium concentration, which is e to the minus the square root of gamma over d times x. And the only thing you need to know is that in XML, the exponentiation symbol is carrot, not star star. So it's not like it's it's not the one that Python is. Okay, so why don't people try that? If if changing the initial condition is too much of a problem, just put in the the decay coefficient. That's really all you need. And let me just show you the, the code in action, the way I've got it, and then you can play with it and try to get it right, version of it for yourself. Um, this is the output, but let me start it over.
So here's my initial chemical field. You see it's steeper towards the left and shallow towards the right. And I'm going to plot the position versus time. So the slope of this line is going to be the typical velocity of the cell. You see the cells moving to the left. And it's noisy, but as time goes on, that line will get steeper, which indicates that the cell is speeding up as it goes to the left. Now, if I started with the cell all the way to the right-hand side of this, it would be more interesting, but it would take an awfully long time because when the cell's moving slowly, it really moves slowly. And so I, it's not in, in class, it's not worth waiting for it. But you'll see how the cell is accelerating here. And now it's going to stop because it's going to bump into the, the left hand wall. Okay. And let me show you the code for this. And maybe people can try. If you've got it working yourself, that's great. But if you don't, uh, let's just, again, it's all in the XML that you need. The plot of the velocity, you don't need to do yourself, although it's not hard to do. Let's walk you through that together. I have a global diffusion constant here, which I set to 0.1. Bubble decay constant, I set to, actually it should be, oh, I don't know what happened. I, I, I've got a mistake in this code. Again, 0 0.001. The initial concentration was 10 times e to the minus x times the square root of 0 0.001 divided by 0.1. Left-hand value was 10, right-hand value was zero. Periodic boundary conditions in the Y direction, single cell. Let me fix this. See how it changes. My typo didn't make a big difference to the result. Let me come back to the code so people can look at that together. Again, in the diffusion solver, the only things you're changing from the linear diffusion are we're creating a global diffusion constant, 0.1, global decay constant here of 1 ten thousandth. Initial concentration, I have to, I can calculate by hand what the final one is. It's 10 is the maximum value, times E, 2.7 is an approximation to E. Unfortunately, XML doesn't know E as a symbol, as far as I know. Um, times the position, times the square root of the gradient of the decay constant divided by diffusion constant. So the only things I'm changing are these three lines here in that linear diffusion example. Give me a thumbs up if you get that working, okay? If you need help with that, please ask in the chat.
So the only thing in this code that is in the Python is the plotting of the position of the sun. I just plot the, the, the X center of mass position of the cell at each time step. So if you've got it working, there are a lot of games you can play. You can change the initial position of the cell by putting it further to the right, so it takes longer to get started. Uh, you can uh, change the global diffusion constant or decay constant to change the gradient. And we're going to need this code in a minute uh, for the next step. So I want to make sure everybody either run the, the version that I had in my in my uh, demos or, or get it working on your own. And you could say, well, how did you know the initial concentration should be this form? Well, I know I know that uh, with decay from a source, I have exponential decay of the value. And I know the value has to be 10 on the left. And I want it to go to zero on the right. And I know the diffusion length. That's how I got it. But if you started with another distribution, like no chemical at all, uh, you'll see that this will, that the chemical will adjust, but you'll have to wait a while for the chemical field to, to stabilize. And if people have issues like the, the, the font size is too small, so I can't see it, please speak up and let me know so I can adjust the simulations uh, display so that it's what you need. Okay, so five people have answered the poll. So that means there's still several people in the room who, who have not answered it. So I don't want to go ahead until everybody who's here has said something about uh, whether they've got it or not. Do people need more time? If you need more time, raise your hand. So if you're having trouble with it, Elmer says he'd like a little more time. You want a screen share? Oh. It's easy to make a parenthesis error when you're specifying that initial concept. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? All right. So now. What you should see, I hope, is something that looks like this. You see the chemical concentration is high in the left and basically very small on the right. When the cell is to the right, it moves very slowly and then it accelerates and then bumps into the wall. So in reality, as I say, cells don't do that. Once they start moving in response to a chemical, Unless the concentration of the chemical is very small, they move with a fixed velocity. And the way you can do that computationally 
biologically, one of the ways they do that is by changing the, the, the strength of the response. They actually change the number of chemotaxis receptors on the surface of the cell. So that if the cell is an environment with very little chemical, it has a lot of receptors, so it's very sensitive. If the cell is in an environment with a lot of a lot of chemical, it reduces the number of receptors, so it's less sensitive to the same chemical. And so uh, conceptually, you could imagine that that takes some amount of time. The, the adaptation doesn't happen instantaneously, but it happens pretty fast. And what's called perfect adaptation assumes that that adaptation happens instantaneously, which is what we're going to simulate. And the simplest way to do this to adjust for an exponential distribution is to say that lambda chemo is smaller when C, when the concentration is bigger. Why is that? Well, the gradient is proportional to the concentration. And so if I have a gradient where the typical concentration is 100, typically the strength of that gradient will be 100 times what that gradient is where the concentration is 1. And so to a first approximation, uh, if I want the velocity of the cell to be independent of the concentration of the chemical, I can say that the velocity should be lambda chemo divided by the concentration. Now, of course, it's possible that I could have a high concentration with a small gradient sitting on top of it. And in this particular case, the cell won't respond to that. It will basically ignore it. Uh, the cell is, if you're a biologist, you talk about fold changes a lot. The cell is sensitive to fold changes, not to linear changes in concentration. Now, why don't I use in the, in, this, in the formula, why don't I use lambda chemo divided by C? Lambda chemo divided by the concentration. Why don't I do that? Somebody? What would the problem be if I have lambda chemo divided by the concentration? Right, Elmer says, well, if the concentration were zero, that would blow up. Exactly. So, so, so Giuliano says maybe maybe you make it the, the value too big when the key, C is small, even if it's not zero, it's impossible. Uh, but you could, but but you definitely don't want it to go to. You don't definitely don't want that value of lambda chemo to blow up. And so typically you have a number lambda chemo divided by something plus the concentration. And uh, one thing you could play with, and, that, and to do that, you use the, the, the tag in the XML log scaled coefficient equals, and then the value, 1.1.01. .01. You'll find that actually doesn't make that big a difference. And so what I'd like you to do is take the, uh, take the, uh, I've cheated, but take the example that I've given you, and just change that one line where you have chemotaxis, add the words log scale coefficient equals. And I would try something like our ranges between zero and 10, make it 0.1 instead of one, which is what I suggested here. And then run it and tell me what happens to the velocity as a function of position. And if you want to challenge things, move your initial position of your cell all the way to the right-hand side of the simulation. Don't have it touch the edge, though. Almost to the right-hand side. So you just have to take your code and add one tag to your, to your chemotaxis specification. And if somebody is willing to show me what they got when they have that working, that would be great.
And I'll say that, that these days when I write simulations, I almost always use the saturated, the saturated or log, log scaled chemotaxis. Biologically, it's a lot more realistic in terms of how the cells behave. Now, on the other hand, if, you, if you're trying to replicate older papers, we didn't have it and most, most code didn't have it. And so the other form is the one that you'll see. Elmer says he's got a bug. Let's see what he's got. Okay. Hold on a second. Let me mute so you can turn on your sound. Okay, does anybody else want to try? Show their results. I'll screen share the, the assignment again while we're waiting. Nope. So all you need all you need to do is is change the one tag in your XML in the code that you were working to say log scale coefficient equals 0.1 or one. Okay, most people seem to have got it. Does somebody who got it want to show it? Everybody says they're done, but they're not volunteering to show it. So somebody show it for me. Or shall I just call on somebody? Ibrahim, do you have it working? Hmm. No, yes. Sorry about that, Professor. I'm still finishing up a couple of things that I must have, that I need to do. I accidentally closed CompuCell, so I have to like read to start it. Okay, somebody else? Logan, did it work for you? Awesome. Okay. 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 Elmer says he wants to share. So let me, so let's do this. Okay. Hope you can hear me. Yeah. So my screen is here. So I. Do I should? Do I not? Second. Yes, now it works. So my problem is okay. I have done this setting, and I think I have somewhere a mistake here in my code. So at the moment. This would be my initial co condition. And when I save it, 
And what run it, then I have zero. It's just zero concentration of oxygen. Look at the minimum mass value. They're zero. No, look at the minimum mass value. Okay, minus uh, two. <laughs> yeah, two to the power of three hundred. So that means I make a calculation mistake somewhere. Yeah. It's okay. Okay. All right. Oh, so it's yeah, that's what you want. Yeah, that's that's right. Because because if it, if a zero is what you want, and and for larger values of x, it will go to, it will go to zero. Um, so that's okay. Go down. Let's see what we got. Constant values at the end. So let's. Do you have any Python? We don't have any Python at all, right? Hmm. I mean, it's not nothing yeah, going on. So let's try. That's it. Looks to me like it's a brown. Let's see. Say, okay. And then here we are. Why don't you just do a single step? This one, right? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so something is wrong with your your uh, XML. Mm -hmm. Let's do an initial condition of one hundred and see. What happens? Ten, right? ten, yeah. Uh, here, XML. Let me see. Should work if it works. That goes. That works. So it is this formula. It's something in this formula. Okay. So check it in. Oh, and you got it missing the zero. In the DK. In, in, in the initial concentration line, you're missing the zero. And this is. Just be sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just try to get mm, see. this should be all right. I'm convinced. Okay, let's say it again. Let's try. Maybe matching happens. Mm.
Okay, this is mistake for me. The XML. This is an XML mistake for me. Yeah, that's it. Uh, oh no, no, this one. Oh, yeah, this one. Yes. Okay. So. Whatever. Say again. It's like a two point seven to the minus sign. Two point ten times. Ten times two point seven to minus sign. Yeah, really the decreasing time. Yeah. Mm, here you mean. Let's see. Mm, can I? Mm. Yes. Good. Formula. Where are we? Where is my code? Does anybody else have it working? Yeah, maybe somebody else can show. Somebody on the show? Look at that. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? How's it going? Well, we're a little late, so why don't we take, tell you what, why don't we take a five minute break? No. So why don't we take a five minute break? We'll be back at 7.15. And then maybe if people are able to get it working during the break, that's great. Otherwise, uh, we'll, I'll show you what I got and we can take it from there, okay? Okay. So let's get back to this. I want to come back to, here's what I get when I do this. You'll see initially my velocity was very slow and then it accelerated. When I put in that logarithmic adaptation term, the velocity is almost linear, uh, independent of the concentration. And let me show you what I did code-wise to this. I went into the uh, chemotaxis field and I increased the lambda chemo a little bit. It was 100 before I made it 200. Maybe if I'm impatient, I can even make it a little bigger, 400. And then I added log scaled coefficient. And I decided to not make it one, but to make it small and see what happens. So I tried 0.001. Okay. Everybody, you can try that if you like. So change the value of lambda chemo to be a little bit bigger and then added log scaled coefficient. Mm -hmm. 1,000. And now I'm going to run that. I'm going to run that. Let's see. Here. Let me share. Okay. 
And I'm going to run that here. And let's see what happens. My cell's moving. The movement's a little bit noisy. But you'll notice that the velocity of the cell is almost constant. The slope of that line is about flat, even as I'm going from a region of low concentration to high concentration. And if I want to make the game a little bit harder, I can start with the cell a little bit further to the a little bit further to the uh, left. Let's see where I started it here. I started it in the middle at fifty. Let me put it all the way to the to the right hand side where the concentration is very low. I started at eighty five. Now my cell is all the way to the right, so it's in a very low concentration field. And you'll see even for that very low concentration, it's still moving essentially linearly. So this cell can now adjust to a wide variety of chemical concentrations and still respond with a constant velocity. Were people able to get something like that? Did people, did, if, does anybody have a problem they want to go over? So the the concentration in the in the in the field is going over a factor of let's see 0.04. So 10, 100. 200, uh, ranging over factor 200, and yet the velocity is constant. So the cell is adapting very, very well over a range of 200 in concentration. So I hope that, that that's something that people can play with a bit. Try to try to figure out. The other thing that I wanted to try, and this is a little bit of an experiment because uh, it's a simulation that was written by uh, by uh, Pedro in Brazil, is is to actually use this kind of uh, problem, this kind of uh, model in a in a biologically meaningful context and i wanted to talk about uh, the way blood vessels form and so blood vessels organize in uh, two fundamentally different ways one is called angiogenesis and one is called vasculogenesis and in uh, vasculogenesis which happens in the peripheral tissues uh, the blood the the cells that are going to form the blood vessels, which are called endothelial cells, uh, vascular endothelial cells or ECs, um, are distributed uh, in the tissue a little bit like raisins in bread. And these cells uh, find each other. They form struts, sort of a three-dimensional chicken wire, and then they reorganize to form tubes, connected network of tubes. And then blood starts to flow through them and the small ones disappear and the larger ones are reinforced. And that leads to uh, what's called a vascular tree, which is that classic branch structure you have in your vasculature. Uh, in what's called sprouting angiogenesis, you have an existing blood vessel and you get small bumps that come off of that and those grow and form new blood vessels. So more like the growth of a tree. And one of the questions was, is it possible to have the same, it's the same cell type. Presumably those cells are responding to the same chemical signals, but this, the situation couldn't be more different. In one case, you have a strut of cells or a tube of cells. 
and you have branching coming off of that tube. But the other case, you have dispersed cells behaving as individuals. And so uh, the question is, uh, can we actually model these things together? Um, there was old work, this is very old simulations that we did uh, 20 years ago. Uh, there was very old work uh, that suggested that the cells are essentially kibataxing, moving up gradients of a chemical. In this case, the chemical is called the vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF-A. And there was nice experimental work by uh, and simulation work by Serini and Ambrosi, Gamba, Preziosi, um, uh, trying to model this. And this is actually a, a PDE model. It's not a it's not a, a cellular model that they published back in 2002. And so we uh, there was one interesting observation, which was that. Uh, Cells do migrate to higher concentrations of uh, other cells, which suggests that they're attracting each other. Um, that if there's too much VEGFA, the cells don't know where to go. Um, and the other thing that we found was that, um, now this was experimental, was that when cells contact each other, the surfaces of the cells that are in contact don't respond to the chemical. They don't chemotax. Uh, and when their cells are in contact with the medium, they do. And experimentally, if you inhibited that inhibition so that you made the cells respond everywhere on the surface of the cell, instead of getting branched vessels, you got blobs of cells. And so this was a, a experimental work, uh, 2008. And so we built a, a simple simulation, and this is I tend not to show you the, 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 the mathematics. Uh, this is a very old slide, so it still shows all the math. Uh, but this is not anything very, uh, very complicated. Um, we have the first term is our regular contact energy term. Uh, the second term is uh, the saturated chemotaxis that we were just uh, looking at. Slightly different form of it. The one that we just used is actually better than the one that's in this paper. Uh, volume constraint, and in this case, there was also a surface uh, area constraint. And the chemical is secreted by the cells. Uh, it decays and uh, it diffuses. And so what's a little bit different in, the, in our self-generated gradient case, we had a, a, a chemical that was available in the outside environment that the cells were absorbing to create the gradient. In this case, we start out with no chemical in the environment. The cells are secreting the chemical and responding to it themselves. And that seems a little bit perverse because if the cell wants to find the highest concentration of the chemical and it's secreting it, by definition, the highest concentration is where the cell is. And so you might expect that the cells either wouldn't move or would all blob together. And so it winds up that actually it's only because of the contact inhibition, because the surfaces of the cells only respond where they're not in contact with other cells that this works. And this is the result that you get. Um, uh, and the top right is, a, is experimental picture uh, from the group in Torino, Ambrosi and, and company were in Torino in Italy. Uh, this was actually an experiment that we also did in my lab when we had a wet lab. Um, it's not a hard experiment to do. You can take uh, human umbilical vein endothelial cells, QVEX, which are human cells, primary cells. Uh, when babies are born, the umbilical cords usually don't not used for very much. You can take the endothelial cells from them. Uh, that, that also means that they're different every time because it's not a cell line, so it's primary cells. Every time you do it, they're slightly different. So they come from a different baby. Uh, and you can culture those uh, on a, in a dish and they organize in the way you see here uh, on, the, on the top right to make, uh, initially they're distributed and then they gradually cluster together uh, and form this pattern. And as time goes on, first they form solid struts and then 
they actually reorganize to form tubes. We're not going to model the tube formation here. And here is the simulation. And in the case uh, where all the cells secrete the chemical and respond, they do what you would expect, which is they form blobs. They cluster like that. But if I say that the surface where the cells uh, are touching each other doesn't respond to the chemical, they organize to form struts. And so uh, there are a lot of questions we can ask about this. Um, in this case, I don't have the exercise written, but I do have the example code. And so what I would like people to do is uh, load the simulation that's called angiogenesis from the uh, student materials folder. And I'm gonna do that along with you. Let me first make sure I can find it before I embarrass myself by doing the screen share. And I hope it works because uh, it was sent to me by, uh, by Pedro today. And this code also should be running uh, available to you actually on NanoHub. If anybody's still using NanoHub for their simulation, um, this code is available on NanoHub. You know, it's just called angiogenesis. Pedro's documented it very nicely. It's actually a really good example of how you might want your code to look for your for your um, for your uh, projects on NanoHub. Let me run it and see if it runs, and then we can work on it together. Does that, I'll give people some time. Everybody, see, make sure you can download it. And get it to work. Okay, has everybody found the code? The student materials, demos for lecture 12, angiogenesis. Does anybody need help finding it? So let's look at this code together. So Pedro has put in a nice comment about where the code comes from, who wrote it, and why he wrote it. He's using a lattice of 128 by 128, although he says going to 500 by 500 is better. And it's actually in 3D, it's interesting to have more than one cell type. In, in 2D, uh, there's a limit. Uh, here he's got lambda volume being very large, which is a little bit unusual. You know, it'd be interesting to see that. Uh, the contact energy in this simulation is actually pretty important. So we could play with that. He's got the contact energy of cell to cell twice that of cell to medium, which means that they don't stick to each other. He's got linear saturation, which is what uh, what uh, we had in the old simulation. You could try that log saturation, the one that we, we just did, and it might be a little bit nicer. Uh, lambda chemo is pretty big. Uh, in the original paper, you could do what uh, what uh, Elmer suggested earlier, which is make the cells not round, but elongated. And so the length constraint allows you to have elongated cells because the actual endothelial cells are not 
round if they're elongated. And you have a he uses a diffusion constant of one, the k constant of 0.25. So that means the diffusion length is what? One divided by 0.25 is four, square root of four is two. So the diffusion length is very, very short. It's just two voxels. And it's interesting if you change that diffusion length, you'll get a different pattern. The cells are secreting at a constant rate. You have periodic boundary condition. And he lays out the cells in a square lattice with a big gap between them. Are there any questions about that code? Does everybody have the code available to them? Maybe a show of hands if you've got the code loaded. Gabriel says he's got it. How about other people? Mike, you've got it. So let's try running it. So this is pretty simple code. There's no Python, it's just XML. This is the initial condition. And let me turn on, let me show the VEGF field. This is a, a starting. And you see the cells are secreting VEGF. Okay. And now I'm gonna run it. And you'll see immediately the cells begin to form struts and they reorganize to form these uh, domains. And one of the things that's sort of interesting is that you'll see the domains form, and then you'll see the boundaries of the domains will get kinks and there'll be struts that will form and divide the, subdivide the domains. So for example, here, Here, you see there's something, a bit of a spike, or here, it's trying to stretch out. Are people able to get that to run? So if you've got it running, try changing the diffusion length. You can do that by changing the diffusion constant. Make the diffusion constant half the value you had before. What happens? Somebody tell me. How does the pattern change? It's probably nicer to do a bit of a, bit, a slightly bigger simulation, uh, but uh, it runs a little bit slower. So starting with this isn't bad to explore. Oh, I left I left out something quite important actually when I went over the code. I left out the single only thing in the whole code that made a difference, by the way. Um, in the chemotaxis plugin, chemotaxis by type, K 
chemotact towards medium. That says that the surfaces of the cells only respond to the chemical field when they're in contact with medium. So let me try changing that. If you're doing this at home, you can do the same thing. I'm going to try running exactly the same simulation without that limitation of chemotax towards medium. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing without the block with without the restriction that only chemotax on surfaces that are touching medium. What's going to happen? Somebody? Elmer says it should be a clump because that's what I said it should be. So let's see what happens. Initially, it looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? Starts forming struts. But notice those struts break apart now. I don't get stable, stable struts. And then if I keep waiting, gradually this will form blobs. So a very interesting question is why? Why would it matter that the surfaces of the cells that are inside the clump don't respond to the chemical? And if this were if this were a biophysics class or a fluid dynamics class, I would probably assign that as a homework problem. Um, in reality, it's a rather subtle question, not a simple thing to answer. And I, I think uh, I'll let you I, I'll let you think about it a bit. If people are interested, you can ask me next week, and I'll tell you. Or you could look in the in the articles and you read about it. Uh, but that was not something that was understood. That was actually a, a result from these simulations. That 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 contact inhibition is necessary. And my my graduate student Abbas Shirinafard. Uh, has a worked on this a lot. He actually did the the full mathematical uh, proof of this, although somehow it was one of the things that never got published. And it's a pity in a way. Elmer says, "Why wasn't the work published?" Uh, he said, "Was it because of a hostile reviewer?" Well, the answer is yes. It was written up and it was submitted. Uh, the reviewer didn't like it because they didn't understand the mathematics, to be honest. And then uh, Abbas graduated and went on to a great postdoc and did other things. And so it never got finished. Um, but uh, it's a, it's a, a, a mathemat numerical instability, a mathematical instability of a particular kind of fluid which is rather interesting these days when people are interested in what's called active matter. Uh, this has become rather a hot topic, this kind of behavior. Were people able to get that to work? Switching between these two, between these two kinds of, um, between these two kinds of behaviors. Um, you say, Gabriel says, it also happens the global diffusion constant is low enough. So let's see what happens. So, so do you want to show us what you got, Gabriel? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I'll just have to redo my simulation here in a sec. 
Yeah, you see it branching and forming those struts very clearly in that simulation that we're just running. So I just changed um, the global diffusion constant down to a half. And then after a while. What was it before originally? Uh, it was one. Because okay. normally, normally what you should find is that as you make the global diffusion constant smaller, the width of the struts gets narrower. And so it's, a, it's interesting to me if it's doing the opposite. But yeah, it looks like it's collapsing. You're getting, you're getting the big blobs here. Although the struts are not breaking, are they? Yeah, thing what was interesting, my, the, the last one I ran was just one big blob up here and one big blob up here. It was just a single line connecting them. Like they were just touching, but that was it. So yeah, there are a lot of games you can play here. Um, there, there are a couple of parameters, about well, parameters, a couple of metrics to, to quantify these patterns. One of which is the width of the strut. How many cells across are these bands of cells? You notice here, they're about two. It's about two cells wide. Another one you could do look at would be essentially what are the size of these domains, what are called the lacunae. And here, because you're on a periodic lattice, there, there really are only two lacunae. Uh, uh, one at the bottom that's connected multiply across the edges and one at the top. And then you could also ask what's the size of the blob, which you see here. And as you change the contact adhesion, if the cells stick to each other more, you tend to get more blobbing, which makes sense because if the cells don't like to, if the cells like to stick to each other, they're more likely to coalesce. Um, it's going to depend on the initial density of the cells in the environment. And it's also going to depend on the uh, diffusion length and the decay length and the chemotaxis strength. And so you can actually get quite a, quite a variety of patterns, uh, which differ both quantitatively and qualitatively. And if you look in, in Roland Merck's papers, who was the one who invented this simulation, developed it originally, uh, you'll find there's a whole uh, zoology of uh, patterns that you can get as you change the parameters in this simulation. The other thing that you sort of interesting, maybe Gabriel, since we're almost out of time, why don't we use your, your, your code to do that? Let's look at the yeah. code together. And let's uh, go in and uh, let's put the diffusion constant back to what it was. And then uh, let's make the cell, let make the length constraint non-zero. So we make lambda length something like two, I think. And so now the cells will be elongated rather than uh, round. Let's see what that does. Uh, the study of the elongation of the cells and how it changes what happens uh, was a PhD thesis. Um, by, uh, as I say, this, this, this simulation was originally developed by Roland Merckx when he was here working with me many years ago. He's, as I mentioned, you've heard his name before. He's now a professor of mathematics at Leiden University biomathematics, full professor, very successful in the Netherlands. And uh, one of his students actually did a very interesting study of how changing the shape of the cells changes the patterning. And if you make the cells very elongated, uh, you wind up, you don't need the contact inhibition. You can get, you can get away without contact inhibition. Uh, but the system becomes very dynamic Maybe make that length constraint a little bit. We can probably edit it in the model editor without having to go into the, um, no, there you go. 
and you don't have to restart it. There you go, the length constraint. And let's make the, 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 make it 10 or something like that. Or 2.0, 10.0. Oh, for some reason, you may have to hit pause know. in the Mac. Not letting you edit it? Yeah, here I might just do that really quickly in the code. Okay. Um, 10, you said? 10. Yeah. You can play with it a bit. I don't rem actually don't remember the best the best number for that. You'll see if the cells are still round, that means it's not quite big enough. Okay. okay. Any questions? I hope people were able to get this to work a little bit. You'll see that there's something interesting going on. When you do soap bubbles, small bubbles disappear and large bubbles grow. And if you look here too, you'll see that if you have domains, which are small, they tend to collapse and disappear. So there's a corseting process where, where these lacudae are disappearing. But at the same time, you're seeing branching. You're seeing long, where you have long struts, they tend to send out little uh, processes that then break the cells, the lacunae apart. And so you have a balance between the rate at which lacudae disappear. You see the one at the top here just disappeared. And the rate at which new lacunae are formed by the break of the, by the splitting of existing ones. And so, if you let this run for a long time on a big enough simulation, you'll reach some kind of equilibrium where the, the mean size of those domains will stay constant. In the example that Gabriel showed, where things were collapsing, uh, the bead size was very large compared to the size of the lattice. And so we weren't able to see a steady state or the steady state would have been basically one big domain. Uh, but in this sort of environment, you will find that uh, you reach a, a, a dynamic equilibrium where the number of lacunae that are disappearing is balanced by the number that are created. And so again, this, this, is, this, is, real, this is a real simulation of a real biological process. And, and there were quite a few PhD theses that came out of this simple, simple simulation. So, so uh, I thought since a lot of the time what we're doing are sort of what I call toy models, just demos of processes, uh, that it might be interesting to dig in a little bit and look at a simulation that actually uh, was a published publishable simulation of, a, of an, at the time it was done, people did not really understand this mechanism. And so I thought uh, this was added a little bit at the last minute to the to the to the plans for today, but I thought it might be interesting for people to see this connection. Okay. Any questions before we break for tonight? Uh, point. Get, uh, okay. So, 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 okay, so let me, let me do that. Yeah, people, so, so Elmer asked, could we, so I promised in the class that we would talk about uh, how to do, um, apply a force to a cell. This is what we're going to talk about next time. But let me, but let me very quickly just show you where, where to find it. This is sort of a preview. I have to kiss, skip a bunch of slides here. So if we want to do persistent cell migration, we're going to apply a force to the cell. And there is a, a function of plug-in called external potential. And as usual, it has a local flex form. So it's external potential local flex. Uh, external potential by itself allows us to apply a force to all cells of a given type. But putting a force onto a cell in a given direction, all the cells at once is sort of boring because all it does is move all the cells in a given direction. But typically what we want is to be able to control that at the, at the Python level. 
and uh, this is going to be, you're going to see some uh, trigonometry here. Essentially, what you can do in, is you have a series of, of, of forced vectors on the cell, cell dot lambda vec x, cell dot lambda vec y, and cell dot lambda vec z, which is the force in that direction. And so if I want to apply a force at a given direction, I make those values non-zero. Since it's two-dimensional, the force of the z direction will always be zero here. Uh, and that's all that I need to do. Uh, if I want uh, to have the direction change, then I would uh, have an angle. And I have that angle change randomly. But then I have to do a little trigonometry. I have to take the sine and cosine of that angle and update the forces. And so uh, that's, the, that's the code uh, to do that. It's, there are, is a demo in the CompuCell demos that explains this, and the manual also has this. Uh, and the slide deck is also available if you want to look ahead. Uh, but we'll do this next time in, in class uh, together. But uh, yes, I promised you I'd at least show you that simple code, and so there, there it is. The the basic uh, the basic uh, command here is plug in name external potential, uh, and then of course we're not putting in the details because it's going to be in Python, and then in the Python you you set uh, lambda vec x and lambda vec y. Okay, anything else? No? All right, thank you everybody. Thanks everyone for sharing code and for being willing to show when they were stuck and when it worked. I appreciate that. And I will talk to people later in the week and I will see you next week if I don't see you before then.